Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. As we get settled in for this power hour today, I'd like to read a prepared land acknowledgement. So I know that we're tuning in from all over the US today, but as a separated indigenous person, I think it's vitally important that we take the time uh, to be mindful that we are on stolen land. Here in Colorado, we occupy the ancestral land of the Apache Nation, the Arapaho Nation, the Cheyenne Nation, Pebble Tribes, the Shoshone Tribe, and the Ute Nation. If you aren't sure whose land you're on, I would encourage you to find out after this hour. I would also ask that everyone consider what they can do today to actively further the reconciliation process with Indigenous peoples, especially as Indigenous communities have been disproportionately affected by the current pandemic due to environmental injustices that are the direct result of historical displacement, as well as current and continuous broken promises. So welcome everyone. Uh, today is the fifth day of Colorado Endangered Species Week, and we're going to focus on Colorado bats today. So I want to thank you all so much for attending. I see some bat backgrounds and bat t-shirts, and that's very exciting. Um, so we're going to be talking about this largely misunderstood species, and I think it's very timely right now. So my name is Chris. I'm with Rocky Mountain Wild, and we're the host organization for Colorado Endangered Species Week. Um, today we are joined by Kristen Lear, who will introduce us to bats and talk about bats in Colorado, and Rob Shore, who will introduce us to Climbers for Bat Conservation and talk about the project and opportunities to get involved. And then Megan Mueller, who's with Rocky Mountain Wild, will introduce us to the Citizen Science Project Colorado Bat Watch. So after that, we'll be going into the questions and answer portion of the hour, and uh, we'll go through the questions that you submitted when you registered and those that we received via email and on social media. And if you still have questions or if any come up, uh, if you scroll to the bottom of your Zoom menu, there'll be a little uh, chat function at the bottom and you can chat me your questions directly and we'll make sure that it gets added to the queue. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Kristen. Can y'all hear me now? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Chris. Uh, I'm super excited to be here to talk about bats today. Um, I'm a bat conservation scientist, which means I work all around the world to study and protect bats. Um, I've been working with bats for over 11 years officially, but I actually got my start in bat conservation when I was 12, and I did my Girl Scout Silver Award project building bat houses. Um, so this has been a lifelong passion of mine, and I'm really excited to share some of the, the cool things about bats and how we can help them. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, let me see. Okay, can y'all see that yet? Should be coming up. Is that good to go? Thumbs up? Okay. So yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'm currently based at the University of Georgia, so I'm finishing my PhD on the conservation of endangered pollinating bats. Um, but I'm planning to move out to Colorado in a few months um, and hoping to do some more bat work there. So I'm really excited to hear about um, the Climbers for Bats and the Colorado Bat Watch um, program later. Um, so to begin with, I wanna give a little background about bats in general, and then we'll get more into the Colorado bats and what we can do to help. Um, so around the world, there are 1,411 species of bats currently. Um, you can see some of the pictures here. There's a huge diversity of bats, what they look like, what they eat. Um, some, of the, some of these are my favorite ones. Uh, we have the little Honduran white bats at the top that kind of look like little cotton balls, and they make tents from leaves. Um, we have the, the Yoda bat in the, the middle right that was recently discovered a few years ago um, as a new species. Uh, same thing with the badger bat in here in the middle. Um, there's, there's lots of different species and we're learning constantly about, about new species and about the threats to them and what we can do to protect them. So bats make up about 20% of all mammals. So about one in every five mammals is a bat. Um, and I'll get into some myths too, but just a caveat, bats are not rodents. So a lot of people think that they're, they're flying mice or rats, but they're not, they're their own order of animals and they're, um, they're mammals, but not rodents. So bats are found all over the world on every continent except Antarctica. So there's even bats in places like Alaska, Siberia, Hawaii has a bat species. So there's bats everywhere. 
And in the US, we're actually lucky enough to be home to Bracken Cave in San Antonio, Texas, which is the colony of the largest colony of any mammal in the entire world. So I want you to think if you've ever been here, um, it's, it's a fantastic site. Um, but think about how many bats you think live in this cave. Um, this emergence, this is when they come out in the evening, can last up to four hours. So get your number in your head. They, there are about 15 to 20 million Mexican free-tailed bats in this cave. So the U.S. is home to this awesome place, and we actually have uh, Mexican free-tailed bats here in Georgia, where I am, and in Colorado. So we'll talk a little bit more about those in a few minutes. Uh, so some of the bat myths, you know, we hear people talk about bats, and we hear uh, some, some sayings like blind as a bat. Um, so what are some of these myths? Blind as a bat is one of those common myths that you'll hear. Um, and bats are actually not blind. All bats have eyes, all bats can see. Um, you can see here two different types of bats, um, but they both have eyes. Some bats also echolocate in addition to using sight. So they're, they're echolocating using sonar to find their food, but they also do see, and they can see at night just like we can. Another of those myths, like I talked about before, was bats are rats with wings or rodents with wings. I think this is a cute picture, but it's not a bat. Bats are not rodents, um, and like I said, they belong to their own order called Chiroptera, which in Latin means hand wing. So the really cool thing with bats here is if you put up your hand, you can see that the bats have the exact same arm bones. So this is the bat wing, and they also have the exact same fingers. So this thumb right there, that's that little one is the thumb, and then they have the other four fingers, the pointer finger, the middle finger, the ring finger, and the pinky. So their wings are basically their hands, um, which is it's pretty cool. Bats also, the, the myth is that bats all suck blood, you know, there's the, the vampire myth. Um, there are three species around the world that eat blood, um, but there's only three out of over 1,400. So what do the rest eat? The rest majority eat insects. So about 70% of all bats around the world and all the bats in Colorado eat insects. So things like moths, um, we got uh, some cockroaches here, which is good, you know, get rid of all the, not all the cockroaches, but keep them under control. Also things like mosquitoes. So bats are really important to help control these pest insect populations. Things like mosquitoes and things like agricultural pests that destroy our crops, like corn, cotton, pecans, and lots, lots more. And one of the cool things about bat, these insect eating bats, is that they can eat up to their body weight in insects in one night during the summer. So if you had to eat enough hamburgers, quarter pounder hamburgers, to be like a bat in one night, how many would you have to eat? I'm not going to make you actually do the math, but you'd have to eat about 600 hamburgers to be like a bat which is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, these bats have high energy demands, they're flying around a lot, they need a lot of food. And a lot of that food is things like these pest insects. So we like having these bats around. Also, um, some of the bat species around the world, about 8% are nectar feeders. So they're feeding on the nectar from these flowers like cactus flowers and other plants. And what happens is they get covered in pollen. You can see the pollen on their body here. When they get covered in pollen, they spread that pollen to other plants when they feed on them um, and help, they help uh, regenerate these, these plants and help keep them healthy. So there's about over 300 plants around the world that rely on bat pollination as an important mechanism of pollination. Things like bananas, mangoes, cashews, uh, cacao, which we use to make chocolate, avocados, even tequila. We use agave plants to make tequila, and agaves are pollinated by bats. So without bats, we wouldn't have all these things. And I think, personally, that would be a pretty, pretty sad world without all of these, uh, these wonderful things. And like I said, when, when we have the bats going up to the flowers, you can see them getting covered in pollen. This is an agave plant, an agave flower that we use to make tequila. Um, and they're getting covered in pollen when they're doing this. And one of the cool things about these nectar feeding bats is that some of them have these really, really long tongues. Can you see that really long tongue here? They can be one and a half times their body length. That would be like us having a tongue taller than we are. Um, and they use that really long tongue to get into the nectar, into the flower. 
Uh, some bats around the world eat fruit. So this one's eating a fig and it basically takes the, the fruit and it squeezes the juice out and drinks the juice and then spits the rest of the fruit out. And what's in the rest of that fruit? Seeds. So those seeds then grow into new plants. And so these bats are really important to help regenerate places like tropical rainforests because they spread the seeds really far and they help regrow new areas. Now there are some carnivorous bats, which I think are really cool. Uh, this one here, this fringe lip bat is gonna eat a frog, a poor little frog's about to get eaten, but pretty nifty. Some bats do eat birds. So this one's caught a bird during migration when the birds are migrating. Some bats do eat other mammals. So this is, has a rodent, but some bats even eat other bats. And there's even fish eating bats. So this is one of the bats, this is a bulldog bat that flies down and catches the fish from the surface of the water with its back feet and then puts it in its mouth and flies away. So we can see there's a huge diversity of bats all around the world. Um, and, and there's lots of fun facts. Some of these uh, facts are really neat because they have conservation relevance. So this, this bat here, the Brant's myotis, found in places like Siberia, is the longest lived mammal of its size in the world. So they're you know, about this big. They're about the size of a small rodent. But unlike a rodent that usually lives two to three to maybe four years, these bats have been recorded in the wild living at least 41 years, um, which is pretty amazing for the, their size and how high their metabolism is. Um, so this is really important because these are long lived animals um, that don't reproduce very quickly. And so this is important for conservation as we'll see in a little bit. Um, another cool fact, the largest bat in the world, one of, is one of the flying foxes that eat fruit, so they don't eat anything but fruit. Um, and they have a wingspan of up to six feet. So that's, that's longer than my fingertip to fingertip. But they only weigh about two pounds. So they're not very big. It's most of that, most of that area is their wings, which are really thin, and they don't actually weigh that much. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have the world's smallest bat, the bumblebee bat which is about the size of your thumb tip, so quite tiny, and it weighs less than a penny. So really, really tiny bats. So we have everything from six foot wingspan to tiny little bumblebee bat that weighs less than a penny and everything in between. And across the world, there are, like I said, 1,411 species. In the US, there are 47 different species. And in Colorado, there's 19 or 18, depending on uh, the source you look at. But which is a pretty good amount. I have here in Georgia where I live 16. So y'all have a little more than I do. So some of the bats of Colorado, um, they're 15% of Colorado's native mammals are bats. Um, so they're, they're very important to the ecosystem like we've heard before because all of these bats are insect eating bats. So they're eating things like fly, you know, night flies, midges, um, mosquitoes, moths, beetles, um, and helping keep these insect populations under control. So now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the different species that there are in Colorado and where you might see them. So the Mexican free-tail bat, remember this is the bat that we saw in Bracken Cave in that video of them 15 to 20 million. Um, and these are the fastest animal flyers in the entire animal kingdom in straight powered flight. Um, so these, these bats are not, not in a dive, the peregrine falcon is fastest in a dive, but Mexican free-tail bats can fly up to 100 miles an hour in straight flight. And this is really important because these bats are commuting really far distances. So they fly out from their cave or wherever they're roosting, and they usually fly pretty far and they go to places like cornfields or cotton fields where there's lots of insects, and then they eat those insects and again, help protect those crops. And in Colorado, um, I've, I've never been, but I've uh, looked this up, the Orient Mine, um, which I've heard is really fantastic. There's about 250,000 uh, Mexican free-tailed bats at the peak of the season. So you can go, um, it looks like there's, they have a, an interpretive center. You can take a bat walk um, and learn about the bats there and actually see them come out. So I'm going to, that's one of the first places I'm going to go when I move, move out there. Uh, big brown bats. So big brown bats are really common across the U.S. Um, they're one of the most common bats if you find a bat in your house. It probably is a big brown bat. Um, they're very well adapted to being around people and so they're very well adapted to living in places like buildings. 
Um, if you see a bat flying around under a street light or like a stadium light at a football field, it's likely a big brown bat because again, they're very well adapted to living near humans um, because there's a lot of insects and mosquitoes and things around you know, people's houses. So this is probably one of the common ones you'll see in Colorado. Also another fairly common bat is the Eastern red bat. And you can see four of them roosting here in the tree leaves. And this is really neat. Um, these species are tree roosting bats or foliage roosting bats, which means they actually don't roost inside a hollow of a tree or inside of a cave. They actually just roost hanging from the tree leaves. Um, and you can theoretically see these uh, red bats when you're walking on a hike through the forest. Um, I had a friend walking at one of our parks here and she looked up and like eight feet up, there was a red bat just hanging there on the leaf. Um, so these are really common bats you can see, but they're really hard to find because they're pretty well camouflaged. They kind of look like nuts hanging from the leaves. Um, and another cool thing about these bats, the Eastern red bat, is that they can hibernate under leaf piles on the, the forest floor or in somebody's yard. Um, so if you're raking up your leaves in the fall and you happen to find a bat, it's likely an Eastern red bat and it's not sick, it's not hurt probably, it's just hibernating, it's curled up and hibernating. So just put it, kind of leave it alone and it'll be fine. Um, the little brown bat is a, uh, used to be a really common bat across a lot of the US, um, but with white nose syndrome, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, this, this is one of the species that has been hit really hard with white nose syndrome. Um, and these bats, like the, the Brant's myotis, can live really long time. They can live at least 30 years in the wild that we know of. The pallid bat, um, these are really cool bats because they eat things like scorpions. They have these really big um, ears and they use those ears to listen for insects crawling on the ground um, and then pounce on them. Things like um, uh, scorpions here, other, lots of other insects and bugs too, arachnids. Um, but they're really cool. They don't actually get hurt by the scorpion sting. Um, it kind of might hurt, but they're immune to the, they don't die from it. They're immune to the, the poison. And the spotted bat, this is another one in, in Colorado that um, is really neat because it has the, the biggest ears of any bat in North America. Um, and again, they use these really big ears to listen for insects and things crawling on the ground to eat. Um, and they kind of look like a, a cow. They're spotted black and white. So that's why they're called the spotted bat. And then the Townsend's big-eared bat is um, often found in abandoned mines. I know we had some questions about mines. Um, a lot of bats do roost in places like caves and abandoned mines. And these the Townsend's bats, big-eared bats, are especially sensitive to human disturbance in these mines. Um, so while the Townsend's big-eared bat is not endangered, it is a special concern species in Colorado because they're so sensitive to disturbance. Um, and so there's a lot of work to gate old abandoned mines um, to protect these bats while they're roosting. And so talking about some of the threats to bats, you know, what, what's happening to bat populations around the world, um, loss of roosting and foraging habitat is, is the number one cause of bat declines around the world. Um, this is for things like, you know, clearing land for development or agriculture, um, even the way that we do forestry, um, cutting old trees that tend to have roosting sites for the bats, um, all of these things can contribute to bat declines. Like I mentioned before, disturbance of roosting sites by people, so like a cave that people go into and maybe like light a fire and hang out there, or they vandalize the cave with graffiti. Um, these are all things that disturb the bats that are inside and can lead them to either abandon the roost or in some cases, um, you know, people might actually kill the bats in the roost. The energy industry is something that has been increasingly more and more um, acknowledged as a potential threat to bats. For example, wind energy here, we have the big, the giant wind turbines that can um, attract bats um, when they're flying close to the wind turbines. They can either get hit by the blades or suffer from barrow trauma, which is um, when the pressure changes around the turbines cause internal damage to the bat um, and can cause death. So we're still learning a lot about what, what we can do to, to mitigate these things um, with wind energy. There's things like curtailment, which is slowing down or stopping the turbines at really low wind speeds, which is when most of the collisions with bats tend to happen. Um, so that's curtailment. Um, there's also um, Kind of deterrence to get the bats away using sound to make them not want to come to the area. 
there's a lot of research going into this and how we can prevent these bat deaths. And then finally, pesticides. Um, pesticide use on agricultural crops can be a problem for bats. Um, they can eat the, the insects that, or, or get, pick up the contaminants from the environment. And this can lead to death or it can lead to um, reproductive failure or problems. Um, the moms can pass pesticide residues onto their pups through their milk. Um, so the, these are, have long-term effects that we aren't really um, completely sure about how they affect bat populations in the long term. And like I mentioned with white nose syndrome, um, white nose syndrome is a really big problem across the, uh, the US and Canada right now. It started in 2006 in New York State um, and since then has spread westward um, all across the country and all into Canada too. And what it is, is white nose syndrome is caused by a fungus. You can see the fungus here that grows on the noses, the, the ears and the wings of the bats while they're hibernating. And so it's kind of like, like poison ivy, it kind of starts irritating the skin, which wakes the bats up from hibernation. And so when they wake up from hibernation, their energy is ramped up and they get really hungry. So they fly outside the cave looking for insects to eat. And because it's the middle of winter, there's no food, there's no insects around, and it's really cold. Um, so these bats either usually freeze to death or starve to death. Um, and since 2006, it's killed over 6 million bats. This, that estimate is from 2012, I believe, so it's, it's a lot higher now. Um, but this is a big problem for these cave roosting bats. For example, the little brown bat that we saw earlier um, is one of the Colorado bat species. And in places like Pennsylvania um, and across the US, the little brown bat was one of the most common bats in the country. And it was one that you would see flying around a lot. But with white nose syndrome, um, they've suffered declines of up to 99% in a colony. So if the fungus gets into a cave and into a colony of bats, it can kill 99% of the bats in that colony. Um, and this has prompted states like Pennsylvania to list the little brown bat as an endangered species, which is crazy because they used to be only, you know, a decade ago or a little longer, they used to be one of the most common species there. Um, so these, this white nose syndrome and all these other threats are combining to, to, to lead to really big um, problems for our bats. And we can see here, this is the range map of white nose syndrome. And it's, like I said, it started in 2006 in New York State and has since spread westward. And um, it has reached uh, Washington and California into Texas. It is not, as, I don't know about the, the, this year's surveys, but it's not in Colorado yet but it's really only a matter of time. It keeps spreading um, and, and we keep learning more about it. And one of the challenges with bats and bat conservation is that bats are really slow to reproduce. So if you think of rodents that are about the same size as most of these bats, you know, rodents produce litters. They have, you know, 12, 10, 12 babies at a time and they can reproduce multiple times a year. But bats on the other hand, usually only have one baby per year. They only reproduce once per year and one baby. Um, some bats, like the eastern red bat, um, do tend to have twins or even triplets, um, but as a whole, bats tend to have one baby a year. And so you can imagine if something happens to a colony of bats, it's going to be really hard for that colony to recuperate and re, um, re get their numbers because they reproduce so slowly. And this means that about 13% of species worldwide are either considered endangered, critically endangered, or threatened. Um, so those are different categories or different levels, but about 13%, and that's a lot. Um, and another 16% are data deficient, which means we don't really know a lot about those species because they're hard to study, they're hard to find, um, and so we don't really know how their populations are doing. So that's a, a significant proportion of bats worldwide that are under some sort of threat or potential threat. So that's a lot of kind of doom and gloom. Um, and I always like to end on a positive note about what we can do to help bats. So if you are a caver, um, I know there's a lot, I love caving. Um, there's a lot of cavers out there. One of the things that we can do, at least in the white nose areas, is stay out of caves. Um, a lot of caves have been closed to people um, to prevent the spread of the fungus because the fungus can get on your clothes, on your shoes, on your headlamps and equipment. Um, and that's actually where we think that the fungus came from. We think that 
somebody brought it over from somewhere in Europe, we think, and brought that fungus to New York in that one cave in New York in 2006. And since then it's been spreading by bats and probably by people. So staying out of caves is helpful. Um, if you do have to enter caves for some reason, if you're doing a study or you do have to go into it, there are proper decontamination protocols that you should follow. Um, and these are found on whitenosesyndrome.org. It has a whole sheet about like what products to use to, to, to kill the fungus or boiling your clothes in water. There's all these things you can do to, to kill the fungus. Another really cool thing you can do is put up a bat house to provide a safe roosting habitat for bats. Um, so these bat houses can, can be put on places like poles um, in the middle of a field or by a, by a forest. Um, they tend, the higher up, the better. So if you can get it at least 12 feet from the bottom of the house or higher is, is good. Um, bats tend to like it higher up. You can also put them on the side of buildings like this one here. Um, these are all good options for bat houses. And if you're interested in finding information about how to build your own bat house, um, here are some links and I can send you all, um, or maybe we can post these, uh, this, these slides with the links. Um, but Bat Conservation International has the Bat House Builders Handbook, which has great information about how to build your own house and where to put it up, so check that out. And then these other groups here um, have Bat House kits that are pre-cut pre and you just assemble them and they're really easy. I've even helped five-year-olds build them, um, so they're really easy to put, up, put together. And then locally, Pikes Peak Market um, is one of the local places that has bat houses that are approved by Bat Conservation International, um, which is important. You want it to be a, a, an approved or good house that's going to hopefully attract bats. Um, and then just some fun videos. These are some of the bat houses I've put up in Texas as part of my work. Um, and you can see these are Mexican free tail bats. So again, the ones in, in Bracken Cave and ones in Colorado. And th these houses can fit hundreds of bats. And again, we like that because they, they're eating these insects at night and they're keeping the insect populations under control. And this is just a fun video, the infrared video of them hopping out um, when they're coming out in the evening to go hunt. And then you can see them up in there. We can use little infrared cameras to see up inside the bat house and to actually see them roosting together. And they tend to like to roost together in these colonies. Um, these, these are two evening bats right here. Um, if you don't necessarily want to put up a bat house, you can also garden for bats. Um, I know there's a lot of gardeners out there. And you might think, well, if there are no nectar feeding bats in my area, then how can I help bats? Well, one of the things you can do is plant night blooming flowers that will open at night, which will attract nocturnal insects like moths, which the insectivorous bats can then eat. So you'll have your own little ecosystem in your yard if you plant these night blooming flowers. Um, for your area. Um, herb and aromatic flowers are also good, again, to attract those nocturnal insects. Having a water body nearby, if you can have a pond or some sort of uh, water, because that's good for the bats and it helps attract insects. And then also, like I mentioned with the pesticides, if you cannot use pesticides, that's ideal um, to prevent any problems with the bats ingesting them. There's also a, a huge diversity and range of bat organizations out there. Um, if you just Google bat groups or bat organizations, there's a lot. Um, these are some of my favorite ones. Um, bat Conservation International does, does worldwide bat conservation and research. The North American Society for Bat Research is, is mostly North America. Um, the Luby Bat Conservancy is in Florida and they actually have a rehabilitation center for bats that have been brought from like old zoos. Um, and so they have, you can visit the bats there. And same thing with Bat World Sanctuary. It's a rehabilitation center and they have um, bats that they actually take care of. So if you join or donate to these groups that you're helping bats that way. And some of these organizations also have um, an adopt a bat program for all the kids out there. Um, I did something like this in third grade with a, a puffin that my third grade class um, adopted from a zoo. Um, it's the same thing with this. You can adopt a bat and you basically make it a donation, usually about $30 or so. Um, and then you can get information about the bat that you adopted, the species or the individual bat that your money is helping take care of. And um, it's a great, a great thing to do as a class or as a scout troop or you know, for a birthday if you're interested. And then finally, I always like to end with um, telling everyone that basically we can all be bat ambassadors. 
Um, we can go out and tell our friends and family how neat bats are, how important they are for things like pest control and pollinating plants. Um, these are all things that we can do. Just share your enthusiasm and share your knowledge with everyone else. So um, if you want to learn more about Colorado's bats, the Colorado Bat Working Group has some good information on their website. Um, so check that out. And um, I think we're gonna pass it off to Rob to talk about uh, climbing for bats and conservation. So thank you everyone. I see, thank you, <laughs> I see some clapping. <laughs> Yeah. Is that my screen's off, right? Okay. I think your screen is off. How can we can somebody authorize the sharing of mine or is that something I can at the bottom of your screen you should have the option share screen. There we go. There we go. And I have to choose which of the multitude of uh windows I have open to share, correct? Yes. <laughs> I got confused with that the other day too. <laughs> can everybody see that? Good. Um, I'm Rob Shore. I work at Colorado State University with an organization called Colorado Natural Heritage Program. And before I dive any deeper into this program, uh, I wanted to thank uh, Chris and Megan and Paige for hosting this and Kristen for doing all the heavy lifting about the biology of bats. So I'm just gonna take a short bit of time and tell you about an organization that was started uh, some five years ago uh, primarily motivated by the disease that Kristen talked about, white nose syndrome. Um, so I too got my start interest in bats at University of Georgia. I did my master's there some years ago and uh, fell in love with um, these flying mammals that people rarely get an opportunity to see. And so I really appreciate everybody tuning in to get some exposure to this because uh, gosh knows that um, I would have loved these kind of opportunities to learn from bat biologists about what they get to see and what they get to experience. So the hodgepodge of logos that you see on this page is kind of a big old thank you. Um, the Climbers for Bat Conservation Project that got started way back when has really been supported by these groups, um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Petzl Foundation, Wyoming Game and Fish, City of Boulder Open Space, Jefferson County Open Space, and especially the Access Fund. And if you're not familiar with all of those, I encourage you to take a look at, uh, at those organizations for either advocacy for outdoor recreation or for wildlife conservation. Okay, so a quick history lesson. Uh, I'm gonna click really quickly and let you enjoy some pictures of bats and the contribution that climbers have made while I rattle on about our project. Um, because we struggle in the West to find out where bats are, is that uh, the die-offs that Kristen was talking about in the East were pretty easy to see when you had caves and mines with millions of bats and you had the mass mortality. In the West, we don't always have those kind of aggregates of bats. And so uh, working with a climber that was also a conservation botanist, she said that you know sometimes climbers see bats. And that dawned the idea of applying for a grant here at CSU with the School of Global Environmental Sustainability to pull climbers and bat biologists and land managers together to talk about where they might see bats and where we possibly could find new populations to monitor over time. The whole mission was, is where can we find new populations that we'd wanna track in case white nose syndrome made its way out there. And as Kristen said, we haven't documented it yet, and fingers crossed, we haven't, we won't, but, it's just across the border in Wyoming, and it's pretty likely, given the distances that bats can fly, as it's gonna arrive here in Colorado. So um, from those initial conversations some five years ago with climbers, we found out that we had a broad um, group of bat conservation ambassadors that would regularly climb in areas where bats roost. As, as you've seen of some of the pictures that have flown by is that they get better glimpses of bats than sometimes I do, and I purposely look for them. So um, we get this opportunity to see bats roosting in new locations and possibly find people who are then gonna spread the word about the value and excitement of studying and conserving bats. That one right there is a little baby bat that somebody found from a roost uh, that was in a colony along a cliff. And it was this kind of new collaboration that kind of spearheaded uh, us venturing outside of Colorado. And in collaboration with climbers, we write 
now have about 80 records of bats roosting along cliffs. And those come from 11 states here in, in the US, one Canadian province, and two European countries. So the word is spreading amongst the climbers that they have a role to play in helping us conserve bats and locate them. So um, I'm going to keep my conversations pretty short here. Um, if you do want to find out more about our program, the Climbers for Bat Conservation uh, website um, URL was up there briefly. And, uh, and please uh, check out more information about how climbers are contributing um, to our efforts. We couldn't have made this happen and understand where bats are roosting without the contributions they're making while they're out there just recreating. And uh, I won't take too much more of your time, Megan, because I know you want to talk too. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen then. Um, So um, I'm Megan Mueller. I'm a conservation biologist with Rocky Mountain Wild, which is the organization hosting this event. And I hope you all really enjoyed Kristen and Rob's presentations and learned as much as I did. <laughs> um, and so I'm just gonna talk very briefly before we answer all of your um, pressing back questions about a new citizen science initiative that we're planning here in Colorado. Um, I'm working on planning this initiative with Paige Singer, who's um, also here with us today and is, is pictured on this slide. And so we're planning a new citizen science project. It's gonna be called Colorado Bat Watch. And it's a collaboration between a bunch of different agencies that manage bats and bat habitat um, and Rocky Mountain Wild. And we're planning to launch the project um, later this year. And in some ways, it's, it's similar to the project that Rob is doing, um, Climbers for Bat Conservation with Climbers. We're really interested in finding um, new populations of bats in Colorado in places where we know they probably roost, but we don't have very much information. So we're hoping to crowdsource information from the public on locations of bat roost sites, so places where people see bats roosting. Um, and we, we want to focus on um, human structures like the old barn that you see um, on the top right in this picture, bat houses, um, bridges, those kinds of places, because we know that bats are really frequently roosting in those kinds of locations and we don't have very much information about that. Um, we're also interested in bats roosting in Talus. So those of you who spend a lot of time in the mountains in Colorado have probably seen big piles of broken rock called talus. And there's some new information in Colorado that bats may be um, roosting in talus quite a bit. So we're interested in that. And then also bats roosting in trees. Um, and so that's what we anticipate focusing on. And then over the long term, we also want to engage citizen scientists in actually monitoring bats at roost sites through doing emergence counts. So you would actually go out to the roost site and count the bats as they come out of the roost site in the evening. And our goal is to learn more about where bats are roosting um, in Colorado and also whether the threats bats face are causing declines in Colorado. And, and as Rob and Kristen have, have both mentioned, that's especially important given that white nose syndrome may be on our doorstep. And ultimately we want to inform efforts in the state to conserve bats. So, we would love it if, if any of you are interested in joining Colorado Bat Watch. Um, if you're interested in participating, once the project is launched, you can email us at bats at rockymountainwild.org and we'll put you on the project email list and then you'll be notified when the project is launched and informed of any future opportunities to volunteer with Colorado Bat Watch. And those opportunities will include um, this year, providing us any information you might have on places where bats are roosting. Um, and then also in the future, going out to monitor bats at roost sites. And we may have some opportunities to test out those methods um, this year. And then I don't think we'll actually be do, doing monitoring this year, but we will be doing it in the future. So, um, so if you're on our list, you'll find out about that. And so, that's all I have about Colorado Bat Watch. Um, this picture here is actually also from the Orient mine, which Kristen mentioned. So it's a great place to 
visit in Colorado if you haven't been there. It's down in the San Luis Valley. Um, so yeah, that's what I've got about Colorado Bat Watch, and I'll go ahead and um, open it up and let Chris um, let us know what questions you guys have asked, and, and uh, Kristen and Rob, who are the bat experts here, can answer those for us. Thanks. Great. I think some of these questions got answered, so I'm going to skip a few, but uh, our first question comes from Thomas. Thomas asks, how are bats being affected by climate change? Great, Great question. I don't know, Rob, if you want to chat any about it too, um, for Colorado bats, but in general, um, bats around the world are being affected in multiple ways by climate change. Um, we're still learning a lot about the actual effects, but some of the examples for, for example, the insect eating bats, um, some of the problems is that changes in insect prey can happen with, with climate change, with the timing of when insects are around or the abundance of insects. And so their insect prey might not be available as much for those bats. Um, the bats that eat nectar from flowers, um, a lot of times with the, the flowers can change in, in their phenology, which is like when they flower. So the bats might not be in the area when the, the plants are actually flowering with climate change. Um, heat events are becoming more and more common. You know, Australia, we've seen recently with the, the severe heat stress in the flying fox populations um, that actually will kill the bats themselves in the thousands. Um, drought also is becoming more, more common, more frequent, um, which again can affect bats because they need water. So, I mean, there's a lot of different threats with climate change and we're still really learning a lot about it. That's a great question. Thing I, the only thing I would add is, Thomas Halliday, did you ask that question? Good job. I love seeing you, your face on this. The young youth that can get excited about bat conservation, we need you to be part of the membership more and more. So we appreciate that. I think Kristen covered most of it is that we're worried about insect populations for prey. We're also worried about heat stress and how that might change some of the roosting environments for bats. Um, the next question I think we covered uh, is from Emily. Emily asks, any data regarding populations living in abandoned mine attics? Rob, I'll let you take that for Colorado. I'll, I'd love to take that one. I've, I've uh, ventured into a host of mines and attics here in Colorado. Part of what I did was survey in caves and mines looking for bats. And so we know that bats will roost in these mine structures. Um, they're fascinating places to be in, but please don't anybody go in there, they're not safe. Um, they're fascinating because of the possibility of roosting locations that bats could find, is that there's cracks and crevices and different levels that we know that bats could take advantage of. We have yet to find very large populations like we see at the Orient Mine in those, but we know they do use them as habitat. The next question comes from Megan. Megan asks, what is the best way to get a bat sci a citizen science effort out into the world and maintain volunteer participation? Rob, you might have more experience with that. <laughs> um, I was gonna turn it over to uh, Megan, Chris, and Paige to chime in here too, but what I've learned from the citizen science project I've been doing with Climbers for Bat Conservation is the most effective thing that I've found is constantly having conversations with the user group. So I've given lots of presentations at climbing festivals, at climbing gyms, and the more that you're able to interact and chat about the excitement and value of bats is that you find more and more people are just as interested, they're just not, not as familiar. So spreading the word has been the most effective way for climate bat conservation. I think that's exactly Right, Rob. Um, we haven't run bat citizen science projects before, but we do run some other projects around American pika and wildlife corridors. And I think um, I'm always amazed by how many people out there in the general public are really interested and do want to help out um, once they know about a species and know about the issues. Folks are often really fascinated by the species that we have in Colorado. And then um, I also think it's really great if your project can give people a chance to get out and see things that they wouldn't see otherwise. So, you know, our pika volunteers see all kinds of interesting things when they're out looking for pikas, and we anticipate that'll be the case with um, folks seeing 
um, bats emerging from roosts and getting to learn about those. And then I think the, the last thing um, that's really helpful is if you can share with people what their data is doing. So when we plan a citizen science project, we make sure that we have a very clear picture of the, the research questions we want to answer and how that will inform conservation. And we're working closely with agencies that manage bats and their habitat. So that way, every citizen scientist who makes an individual observation knows that they're, they're making a big contribution to research and conservation um, as, as a collective group of, of folks out there. That's a great question. And I'll just add one more quick thing real quick on that. With um, So some of the really successful citizen science projects um, utilize things like social media um, to spread the word, like Rob was saying, and also like Megan was saying, to engage with the people who are participating. Um, so things like Snapshot Serengeti is a, a project that um, is, has been really successful at getting a ton of people to participate and sharing the results with with people on social media and kind of promoting it that way. So um, I think that's a good avenue also to get the word out. Uh, the next question comes from Terry. Terry asks, is there any research on how bats might help reduce West Nile disease? Yeah, so, um, so there are some studies on how they're eating mosquitoes. Um, I'm not sure the, the actual effect, but that is a good, good point is that when the bats are eating the mosquitoes, they can help keep those insect populations under control. Um, and so it, it definitely can't hurt to have the bats around to help control those populations. It's, it's a great idea. We're just now beginning to appreciate how much bats eat mosquitoes. For the longest time, when I was a student, uh, looking at what bats ate is we had to go through bat poop to figure out what they were eating. Mosquitoes do not survive the digestive tract of bats very well. But now that we have genetic techniques, we're really keying in on how much certain bats are consuming mosquitoes, which could have great uh, impacts on controlling diseases that could impact humans like uh, West Nile. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, the next question comes from Christine. Christine asks, what can we do to educate the public about the importance of bats, especially in the midst of this virus? I think, like I said on my last slide, I think just talking about bats, um, there's, there's kind of the formal settings where you do education, like, you know, in classes or, you know, give a talk to a, a scout group. Um, so if you can do some of those, that's awesome. Um, and I know, at least here in Georgia, the Georgia Bat Working Group does a lot of education about bats, and it can involve people who are learning about bats and want to educate others. Um, so check out the Colorado Bat Working Group and others in, in your area to see if there's those opportunities. Um, but also, I think the everyday interactions that we have with people are really should not be shortchanged. Um, those everyday interactions when somebody says, oh, yeah, I had a bat in my, in my house and I hit it with a broom and killed it. You know, that's an opportunity to, to talk to them and, and share some of your what you know about bats and the importance and uh, in a way that's more conversational. So I think there's that everyday opportunity. Chris, I'm sorry, my, my um, Wi-Fi is challenging me right now. Did, did you say in light of the recent COVID infections too? Yeah, that was part of the question, was in light of uh, the, in the midst of this virus specifically. I, th I think there's some opportunity to talk about the wonder of the physiology of bats as well, is that bats um, get a bad reputation uh, as vectors for disease, but the reason that is is because they're amazingly adept at um, avoiding being infect infected. So they have built up immune systems that have been able to fight some of the most dramatic viral infections that we know of. And so we should celebrate the fact that they provide an opportunity for us un learning more about how to prevent these diseases. It's commonly they're only focused on as being the reason we have them, but they could be really the reason we find a cure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I second that. Also a, a great fact sheet on the Bat Conservation International website that talks about kind of myths and facts about bats and coronavirus. So you could check that out if people are asking you specific questions around that. Okay, and I just wanted to put out there that we can put all these resources on the Facebook event page. I know that we're mentioning a lot and there were some in the slides. So we'll go ahead and do that as well after uh, the, the power hour.
So um, the next question comes from Olivia. Olivia says, I primarily work out of Alaska. Have the populations been greatly impacted there? So, so there are five species of bats in Alaska, which is kind of crazy to think about how, how many there are for such a cold um, place. Um, I know it's warm in the summer. But, um, but yeah, I don't know if Alaskan bats have been studied nearly as well as a lot of other bats just because they're, they're harder to find. Um, and there isn't white nose syndrome there, um, at least right now, so that's a positive. Um, but I know there is a lot of work going on to, to track bats in Alaska too, but it's, it's just a lot more challenging. There's not those big numbers that we have in some places. Kristen, Kristen's right is that they have a, a few species there, but it's amazing that they can flourish in even really harsh environments. And some of the challenges of studying them is that Alaska has so much open space that's inaccessible and difficult to get to. But some current studies have been looking at uh, bats roosting and sometimes root structures in Alaska and finding kind of a place to hide out in these large root overhangs. That's a really cool, they, they can, they'll, they'll surprise you for sure. Um, so then we have a, a quite a number of questions about bat houses. So the first one comes from Wendy. Where is the best place to hang a bat house to get them to roost on or around a home directionally or uh, and or height? Yeah, great question. So um, there's a handful of tips like kind of best practices. Um, like I mentioned before in the slides, you want it to be fairly high up off the ground. So the, the minimum recommendation is 12 feet from the bottom of the house to the ground. Um, but I usually say if you can get it 15 feet or higher is even better. Um, and that's because the bats need to, like we saw in those videos, they need to swoop out of the house to, to take off. And so if it's too close to the ground, they'll, they'll run into the ground. Um, so that's just, it's a good way to keep them up. And it also helps avoid predators that can get to the, the lower bat houses. Um, in terms of where to put it, um, you can put it on a pole. If you put it on a pole, those are, those are pretty good, uh, good ways to do it. Um, locating it near trees, but not in trees, like don't put it in the forest um, or in the woods. You'd want it kind of on the edge because you want it to get a lot of sunlight. Um, so typically the recommendation is about six hours of direct sunlight per day. Uh, morning sun is great if you can put it in somewhere that gets a lot of good morning sun. And usually facing south, southeast is, is ideal. Um, and painting the, the color of the bat house is also important. Um, so in Colorado, it gets, it gets hot, but not like Texas hot. And so you'd probably want a medium shade of, of any color. Um, and the Bat House Builders Handbook is a really great tool and resource that has um, a lot of information about more details of all this. Those are just some in a nutshell. The next question is from Loa. Loa asks, what bat species are in Pueblo County? Is it worth putting up bat houses in the city of Pueblo? I'm not sure, Rob, you might take that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, I think Pueblo is a really unique setting for uh, attracting bats. You're at the base or nearby the wet mountains. You've got Pueblo Reservoir nearby. You're at the interface between the um, plains and the mountain environments, and you actually have a lot of diversity of bat species that can be found there. Uh, probably close to the full diversity of Colorado, with the exception of some that are found in the West, is that Pueblo is just such a warm, diverse habitat region with cliffs nearby that uh, I think it'd really be beneficial putting up houses in that area as, as temporary roosts or even long-term roosts for bats in the area. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next question comes from Dan. Dan asks, uh, what is the easiest to install yet effective bat box I can get for my home in suburban Denver? And should I wait, or should I get one soon or wait until a different season? Great questions. Um, in terms of the easy to build, um, those kits that I um, mentioned in the slides that we can share the links, um, those two companies, Habitat for Bats and Bat Conservation and Management, both have kits that are really easy to assemble. They come basically with everything you need except for the, you know, the drill uh, to put it together and the caulk. So those are really great if you can get some of those. In terms of installation, that's the, the trickier part. Um, you know, if you're gonna put it on a pole and you want it high up off the ground, um, I've, for the bat houses I've done here in Athens, we use 21 foot uh, metal poles that are um, basically uh, 
plumbing pipes. And you can imagine those are pretty heavy. So it, it kind of takes some finagling with multiple people to get those up or using some sort of um, equipment. Um, but bat conservation and management, that website um, has some installation tips too to look at um, that might be helpful. Okay, and then the, the second part of that question was uh, about getting one soon or a different season, does that matter? It doesn't really matter. If you can put it up in the winter before the bats come back for the spring, um, that is great because when they're coming back in the spring, they're looking for good habitat to roost in, to have their babies if they're their moms or females, um, or for bachelor colonies, which are the male, male colonies. Um, so if you can get it up before they come back, so by you know March or so, that would be great. But really any time of year is, is totally fine. Bats are really curious, so if, if something new goes up in their environment where they're flying around every night, you know, if a giant pole with something on top goes up, they're going to probably investigate it. And they might not roost there right away, but it'll be noticeable. Okay, we have about three minutes left and a lot of questions. Are, are you able to stay past the, the hour, Robin? I can, yeah. Okay, so the next question is from Cindy. Cindy asks, how did white nose spread all the way to Washington state, jumping a bunch of states? Yeah, um, like I mentioned, we can carry it on our clothing. It's, it's very good um, fungus at surviving. Um, I'm not sure how long it actually can survive, but um, outside of like a cave, but it can survive. And so that's what we think happened is that somebody from some cave somewhere else that had the fungus, traveled to Washington and spread it there. Same thing with California. Um, and that's, that's how we think it got to the US in the first place, is somebody, um, the fungus genetically looks like it's somewhere from Europe. Um, and so somebody brought it from there into the cave in New York State, um, which is why it's so important to, to practice um, proper protocols when you're entering caves. You know, as researchers, if we go into a cave, uh, we put on like full Tyvek suits, to prevent, and then we take those off and throw those away between each cave. We don't like reshare equipment. And if we do have to reshare, we, we do those decontamination protocols. Um, and so that's to help prevent the spread. Okay. Um, the next question comes from Lauren. Lauren asks, how do you expect to come that fear of bats in the future zo uh, due to zo zoonotic and disease related concerns? That's a great question. Um, like Rob was saying, I think with the, um, the benefits of bats, I think stressing those benefits, so the ecosystem services of insect pest control, pollination, and seed dispersal are really important to, to get the benefits out there. Um, but also, you know, bats studying their, their immune systems, studying their metabolism, and how they can fight off infections without getting sick um, will be, I think, a really important thing to stress to people is that we need bats not only for these other benefits, but also probably for our own health. Um, and stressing those is, is really important. Another big seller is to remind them how much bats can save us economically. They've estimated that annually bats consume enough insect pests to save agricultural industry about 23 billion annually with a B. So reminding people of the economic value is also another incentive. Um, and I apologize, I'm probably gonna mispronounce this next name, but from Rabia, Rabia, um, how long might it take a bat colony to find or settle a bat house? Will they find it at once or does it take a few seasons to decide to settle there? Oh, great question. We never know. <laughs> um, that's the one thing with bat houses. It's just like, you might put it up in the best spot possible, like in good sun, you know, in good area <clears throat> where you've seen bats and they don't move in. Um, and so it's, it can be frustrating, but the recommendation is to let them sit up for like at least a couple years um, because it can take that long for bats to move in. But on the other hand, um, some of the bat houses I put up, for example, in Texas, we got bats within a week, um, a big colony, and it turned out to be a maternity colony where the moms gave birth to their pups. Um, so you have kind of all these big spectrums of, of timings. Um, patience is key though with bat houses and also using those best practices of putting them up in the best possible spot that you can 
um, which will increase the likelihood of, of success. The only thing that I'll add is similar to what Kristen's mentioning about the timeline is that I've advocated if you have the opportunity to use older wood, is aged wood may not have some of the chemical treatments that bats could detect, and it may move along faster. They're in their interest in it. Okay. The next question comes from Christine. Christine asks, uh, I'm concerned about the Mexican free tailed bat at the Orient Mine. I know we are told that there is 250,000, but last year there were far fewer than that that showed up. I tried to find out specific numbers, but no one seemed to know, and CPW was not on top of it. So I was hearing in the neighborhood of 20,000 bats instead, saying they weren't counting them properly. So how can we find out accurate information? Ooh, um, accurate information about bat population sizes. That's a mouthful. Um, Bats are challenging already to study and get accurate counts is, is really challenging. I hadn't heard recently the numbers estimated, sounds like an order of magnitude less, I hadn't heard that. So I, I don't know what could be playing a role in that or who could be trying to estimate those populations, but it's really challenging to get good, reliable estimates of population size when you have thousands of bats flying out at the same time and flying away over long distances. Um, the really interesting part about that Orient Mine population is that they're primarily a bachelor colony. It's a bunch of guys that get together each summer and hang out over this really large agricultural valley, which I imagine they're consuming a large number of the insect pests that we want them to. The next question comes from Terry. Terry asks, will there be opportunities to participate in Colorado Bat Watch this summer? Sorry about that. I needed to unmute myself. <laughs> um, we do think that there will be opportunities to participate this summer. We're not exactly sure when we're when we'll launch, but we are aiming to launch this summer. Um, it'll just be the first phase of the project. So um, we'll have an online platform where people can provide information about bat roof sites. And then we may also have opportunities for kind of a smaller number of people to come out and help us test the methods for monitoring bats emerging from colonies. Um, and the reason we're uncertain on the timing is because we're trying to do a really good job of making sure that all the data goes to um, a good place where all the different agencies and researchers can use it. And we're trying to coordinate that really closely with the North American Bat Monitoring Program. Um, so we're just not exactly sure with all of those different players how long it will take um, for us to get the database up and running, but, but we do think we'll have um, some opportunities this summer. And if you go ahead and email us and get on our list now, um, you'll be at the top of the list of the folks who will hear about opportunities if we have um, opportunities for smaller groups to, to help us test some methods. So I would encourage you if you want to participate um, in actually going out to Bat Roost to help with that to sign up early. Megan? Do you want people to email you too if they know of roosts that they have heard of nearby? Yeah, that's an excellent point, Rob. Thanks for <laughs> bringing that up. If you if you know about roost sites um, anywhere, we would love to hear about them now. So go ahead and email us for sure. And you can use um, bats at rockymountainwild.org. You can also look up my personal email on our website. Um, that's Megan at rockymountainwild.org. So go ahead and send us that information for sure. Okay, the next question comes from Thomas. Thomas asks, why have bats been feared? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I have several ideas for this. Um, I think bats are kind of mysterious, right? They're out at night. Um, we don't get to see them like we see birds and butterflies. Um, so they kind of have that mysterious air about them. Um, and a lot of times we tend to fear things that we don't know. I mean, like in the deep ocean, right? We, we don't really know a lot about the deep ocean things and people are afraid of the ocean. Um, so I think that has a lot to do with it. And also, of course, you know, we see things on TV like the vampire movies um, that have played on the vampire bats. And I think that just perpetuates the fear, you know, when somebody's in a TV show or in a movie going into a dark house in the middle of, you know, a scary spot, it's always going to be a bat flies out at them, right? that it, it just ingrains that in our brain, that bats are scary, when they're really not. You know, we've learned that they're really important. Um, they, I think they're cute, you know, they, they look pretty cool. They have 
lots of different types around the world. So, um, but yeah, I think those, we just don't understand them, which is why we can all talk about them and help everyone else learn, learn about bats. Great, great question, Thomas. The next question is from Kimberly. Kimberly asks, what bat is most endangered in Colorado? Rob, I'll I, would, I would tend to point to the one that Kristen identified, the little brown bat. Historically, if you'd asked me 20 years ago, what's the most common bat I would find in Colorado, I would have turned to the little brown bat. But because of its susceptibility to white nose syndrome and its die-offs in other regions, um, it's one that we really need to be alerted to as populations change. Um, one of the best ways that we found to do that, because it's tough to find them in caves and mines, is monitor where they're breeding. And so we've been doing studies in the steamboat area of marking uh, females and their pups and seeing who returns each year. And it's uh, been fascinating to see the longevity and the return of these little brown bats. And thankfully, we don't believe that pop those populations have been impacted. The next question comes from Cindy. Cindy asks, is it safe to have a bat house when my neighbors spray pesticides? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a good question. It's, um, we don't really know, like, um, all the, if they're ingesting the, the insects or what the actual effects are of those bats, but um, I, I would say yes, as long as it's not, like, right where they're spraying. If it's, you know, if you're crop dusting, then, yeah, the, that bat house is going to definitely get pesticides on it. Um, but, you know, and the, for the most part, I think it would be okay, but you might want to chat with your neighbor about, um, about that and kind of maybe, maybe get them to use different chemicals or, or not use pesticides at all. Um, see if there's other ways they can manage their pest insects. Good question. The next question comes from Megan. And it, Megan asks, what infrared camera do you use to monitor bats outside the bat houses? Oh, so I actually, oh, I have, I have one here. Um, this is, um, I was giving a another talk earlier, so I have a demo. This is a Sony camcorder. It's a Sony um, FDR-AX53. Um, basically, any of these camcorders that have the night shot capability can be used with the infrared. Um, and they have infrared built into them, so you can see a little bit. But what I use is I use these little um, supplemental infrared lamps that are from Bat Conservation and Management um, that really light up the area and can let you see. Um, I know like there's apps and stuff for like thermal imaging and like infrared, right? Like on your phone. I've never used one, but you can check those out too. Okay, the next question comes from Anjet. Anjet asks, is white nose syndrome being found? Oh, I, we kind of answered that already. Um, from Jennifer, will bats eat the murder hornet and help save bees? And then also from Dan, will bats eat Japanese beetles? <laughs> you know, that's a good question. I don't, I imagine they wouldn't eat the, the murder hornets um, because they're out during the day, right? And the bats are out during the night. So I would imagine they wouldn't. And also there's those hornets are pretty big and they can sting. And so I imagine even if bats were with them, they probably wouldn't go after them. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good question. Japanese beetles, I think they'd probably take advantage of if they saw them flying around at night. I think those are ones that you can stumble upon in the evening. And there are some bats that will specialize in eating beetles. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question is from, from Morgane. What is the best way to gain experience in your field and to find a position studying bat species? Oh, good question. Well, first of all, attend things like this where you're learning. You know, Thomas is here learning. He's, I'm sure you've learned a lot about bats, right, Thomas? Yeah. Yeah, just get started um, learning about opportunities, um, volunteering with local groups like the Climbers for Bat Conservation. Um, you know, getting, getting your foot in the door that way, I think, is, is really important. Um, and, and just talking to people, reaching out to people in the field and um, social media, too. A lot of bat scientists are on social media, um, so kind of start getting that way and interacting that way. Bats are challenging, is that they're just not as easily to approach and find people who can show them to you. Some, one of the ways that we've been able to get climbers interested is we've hold, hosted bat outings 
where when we have bat biologists trying to survey for bats, we invite climbers to come along and see bats. And that's a great way to get hands-on visual of the bats. But probably broadest way would be once um, the bat watch takes off as being one of the participants who gets to watch bats emerge and count them. Um, the next question is from Jacqueline. Jacqueline asks, have you explored the use of thermal imaging technology to detect the presence of maternal colonies in tree roosts? I have not personally done that. I know um, there are those that technology out there. And I, from what I've read that there's kind of people who say you shouldn't really use thermal cameras to look for roosts like through buildings or through trees because um, you can have hot spots on buildings and trees that aren't related to bats. Um, but at the same time, you can, you sometimes can detect where they're roosting. Um, you can't really count bats through that because it will just be like a heat signature of like, oh, here's a hot spot. And there might be like 30 bats or 50 bats in there. Um, I know one thing that a, a lot of people do do is use the thermal or infrared cameras to watch the emergences. So when the bats come out of the hollow of the tree or the building, then they can count them that way um, using those cameras. It is really fun. What Kristen, also, oh, go what, ahead, Rob. What, quickly, what Kristen describes is exactly what we tried using um, to look at bats as they emerge from cliff systems. Put thermal cameras at the base and try and see them emerge. But you have to be careful because even rocks can retain a lot of heat. And so it's difficult to see the very small thermal image of a bat amongst a big warm background. And I was just going to add that um, we had a call with some folks from the North American Bat Monitoring Program recently, and they're trying to kind of amp up um, their, their efforts around citizen science. And one of the things they're looking at is whether they could um, do some machine learning so that you could take an infrared video of bats emerging from a roost and then um, submit it to their database, um, ideally kind of through us, and then you might be able to Get information back on the number and species without having to count them and figure that out yourself. So I think they're very early on in trying to figure out whether that will even work, but it's a neat idea. Megan, actually, I'll chat with you after I have some info about that. <laughs> yeah. The next question is from Joanne. Joanne uh, says, I hike and trail run above N N C A R in Boulder. Sorry, I don't know. In that. Car. Okay. I have never gone to Mallory Cave. Can I see bats there? It used to be closed to prevent white nose syndrome, but I think it's open now. Um, if I remember correctly, I think it's still closed. I think I see Karen Meany, another bat specialist here in Colorado, shaking her head yes, she's in that area, so I'll use that as a confirmation. Is that they gated that to, um, to limit access. It was a great opportunity to see bats, but it was visited so frequently that bats stopped using that facility. Um, it's right along a very common trail uh, in the Boulder area, and so um, they've gated it to prevent access inside. The next question comes from Thomas. Thomas asks, why is the status of bats unknown? Great question. Yeah, you're asking so many great questions, Thomas. Um, yeah, bats are really hard to study, like we've talked about. You know, they, they're out at night. They're often in these really inaccessible places, like in cliffs or in, deep in these caves. Um, so it's just really hard to find them and to study them in large numbers. Um, you know, we have to have special equipment a lot of times to study bats, like thermal imaging cameras or infrared cameras. Um, that can be expensive, um, so it can cost a bit to, to find bats. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's just hard to study them because of those, those reasons. Um, but, but fun, too. Makes it all the more fun. Thomas, that was the thrill of it for me, is knowing that they're so difficult to get access to and so difficult to study is what got me excited about being one of those who gets the opportunity to, to handle them and see them and try and understand what's happening. So uh, be persistent, talk to bat professionals who get that kind of access, and maybe you'll be up here giving a talk eventually. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next question comes from Morgan. Morgan asks, as an aspiring conservation scientist, what is the best way to gain experience to find employment studying bats? I think in general, getting involved with these volunteer opportunities um, is, is vital. Um, like here in Georgia, we have the Georgia Department of Natural Resources um, and 
they do a lot of bat monitoring, um, including like cave surveys, um, road, like under bridge surveys for bats. Um, and people can get trained and help out with that. And so those opportunities then lead to connections with the people in the agencies um, and can, can lead to maybe employment in the future. Um, yeah, I think those are important. Oddly enough, now is almost a better opportunity to get exposure to doing bat work because now there are funds generated to studying bat populations. Back when I had an interest, there isn't much funding to try and understand what's happening with bat populations. It wasn't until we started seeing these kind of declines. And so there's actually a lot of projects occurring right now looking at bat movements, population size, acoustic recording, and a heck of a lot more citizen science opportunities to be involved with that. So anything you can do to find out your role in, in getting exposed to that early makes you a heck of a lot more marketable. And I, I, I would definitely agree with that about volunteering. I think um, what you'll learn when you, you start volunteering, I don't know if you're in Colorado or if you're in another area, but I think this is pretty true everywhere, is that um, the folks studying bats in a given state are pretty connected with each other. So, you know, if you get involved with Colorado Bat Watch, we're working with the person from Colorado Bat Parks and Wildlife who studies bats and the folks from the Forest Service who are studying bats and Rob from Colorado Natural Heritage Program. And so that volunteering is a really good way to get connected and find out where there might be other volunteer opportunities or internships. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people interested in doing um, research and conservation work these days. So volunteering also gives you kind of an edge um, when, you're, when you're competing for a job. I think folks will see that you've been out there volunteering and doing that work already and that gives you a little bit of an advantage. Great, and our last question is from Cindy. And Cindy asks if you'd be willing to share your slides um, for the presentation. Okay, I definitely will. Okay, great. Uh, we can actually, I, I've got them already, so I can go ahead and post them after we're done along with the other resources. So, I might send you a revised version if that's okay. Oh, right yeah. <laughs> So uh, I'm not seeing any more questions come through on the Zoom chat. So I wanted to thank everyone for you know, attending and joining us and especially Kristen and Rob for sharing your expertise with us. And I wanted, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to remind everyone that tomorrow we have the Endangered Species Day Parade. So um, come dressed up as your favorite species or costumed or with your art, songs, whatever you have, whatever you wanna share and be sure to register for that. And anything anyone wants to add before we close out? Thank you again, Rocky Mountain Wild for providing the opportunity. Anytime that we get to, I'm sure Kristen's gonna acknowledge this too, is anytime we get to interact with the public at any phase talking about bats, it's, it's a pleasure for us. Yep. And thank you all for coming. I mean, everyone, it wouldn't, we wouldn't have this without people coming. So thank you so much for all your great questions too. Uh, and I, I'd like to second that. I really appreciate all of your interest. Um, conservation work and research around species that are in trouble can be kind of um, difficult. And it's, it's really inspiring to see that there are so many folks out there who are interested in bats and might be interested in helping us out with Colorado Bat Watch. And so thank you all so much for your interest in your time and um, we really appreciate it. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for being here and uh, have a great rest of your day. Bye, Bye everyone. Bat hands. <laughs> <laughs> Bye everyone. Bye-bye.